Okay, I think we're all ready to start. Um, we don't have to wait until seven minutes after the hour. Welcome, I hope you enjoy lunch. Whatever it was, it disappeared very fast. Um, so uh, last week we had this talk about how to make better society, how to understand emotions. This week Raul is gonna be talking about the cosmos, but before I introduce him and let him uh, say what he's about to say, I want to remind you about um, the next lecture, which is on the 28th of March. Devara Shah will be talking about effective crowdsourcing, another interesting subject. Uh, and then after that, April 4th, one of our own faculty here, Sharon Singer, will be talking, uh, don't know exactly the title yet, but it will be on the website. So today I'm uh, very pleased to introduce Raul. Raul and I have been friends for, I don't know, infinite amount of years. Um, Raul has his, uh, he got his bachelor in Madrid in Spain, his PhD in Niels Bohr Institute, then he was a postdoc in Edinburgh, Scotland, then a faculty at Rutgers, eventually at UPenn, where we met, and since then we've been friends and working together. Uh, Raul's interest is in cosmology, but specifically how to extract information out of data. Uh, his way of thinking is a little bit like me. We have a famous story, biking in Corsica together, and after a few climbs, that was before this, uh, we ran out of food and we have to find ways to survive. Uh, but we figured it out and we're still here, both of us. So today Raul is talking about too much data and how to extract information. I'll let him talk without further ado. Thank you. Here, Raul. Um, maybe we can dim the lights here at the I, front so people can see better the and this is unmute already, right? Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, Pablo, do you want to take off the lights of the project? Ah, he will come out. So thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here at Harvard. And uh, actually, it's a pleasure to tell you about uh, things I have been doing with the data, but in particular, uh, techniques and tools I have developed over the past uh, almost 10 years to deal with the avalanche of data that are arriving to us. My field of interest is cosmology, and therefore I'm going to be using cosmology as an example of how these tools have been applied and used. But the tools are actually general and can be used for problems that are encountered to anybody that has uh, too much data, but believes the data are described by very few parameters. And the challenge and the things I'm going to tell you about is how you efficiently extract the information that is contained on those data sets within a reasonable amount of time and also accurately in the sense that you know you have extracted those data. So, as I said, uh, I'm going to be telling you things about cosmology and therefore I'm going to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes because I believe Besides Casey and Pablos, there are no other astronomers in the audience, unless I'm mistaken. Okay, so I will be doing about 10 minutes or so of introduction about cosmology, why I think it is interesting, and why it is an, a spectacular example of a data set of too much data with very few parameters. Now, cosmology is exciting because uh, if I was giving this talk 20 years ago, probably what will be coming here to this room with a sheet of paper and all the data that we have observed will be contained there. There will be nothing much to talk about data, much data analysis or statistics because uh, there was not enough data. But in 20 years we have come from a situation of data starved to totally data driven science. In fact, there's so much data that we cannot deal with it efficiently. So I want to tell you three things. What do you do with so much data? How you deal with systematic errors in those data sets? That is uh, things that uh, you kind of bend out the noise by collecting more data. And how you combine experiments or results from data sets. And you're going to see how those three things are interrelated and how those three things are necessary to actually extract all the information. 
Why do I talk about cosmology and why is it interesting? Well, cosmology is a very peculiar science because we do not do experiments, actually. We do observations. There's only one sky, and we can reach the sky. And on that sky, we only pick up the information that is available there. Now, because the sky, the information comes to us in cosmology as a stochastic random variable, you are limited by the number of modes on that stochastic variable you can observe in the sky. That's what the cosmologists will call cosmic variance, but you will call, you know, just stochasticity. The fact that you can only see one sky, and the fact that these things don't change over time, means that you can actually go to the sky and extract all the information. That means you can, you are good enough, you can pick up a telescope, observe all the random, the Fourier components of that uh, map, or whatever it is, or the positions of the galaxies, put it on a hard disk, and that's it. You have collected all the information that there is there. Now it is your task to figure out what is the physics behind that information. Some people ask me, uh, well, has that happened already, or when are you talking about 100 years from now, or when is that going to happen? For something like the temperature of the cosmic microwave background, I'm going to explain to you in a second what that is, that has already happened. We have all the information available in the sky in our data disk, because actually today, I mean these days, on a web server. And that's it, end of the story. And now here at Harvard, what people are trying to do is to actually do the same story with the position of the galaxies in the sky, right? You look at the sky, you look at the positions of where the galaxies are, and then you collect them all. Then you have collected all that into your data server, your website. So, the course of cosmology is that we have only one observable sky. There is no way we can perform experiments. However, the blessing is that we can get all the information that is available there. Now, because we can only make observations, all our inference is going to be model-driven. We are going to be testing parameters of a model that we are proposing. You can also take one step backwards and say, I'm going to try to describe the data. I'm going to see if there are correlations, if there are trends, whatever you want to see. But uh, you can do much more because we know that this is nature and nature should be described by physics and therefore should be simple. And therefore, if you are a reductionist, you should be able to pin it down to the least possible number of parameters describing a model. Of course, the result will depend on the data you are willing to consider in the sense that you have the following challenge for the data set. If you are able to do an experiment, what you can do is the following, or what physicists have done for the last 500 years or 1,000 years are the following. Imagine you get a result and you get only like two sigma significance, right? What do you do? You design a new experiment. So your significance goes up to seven, 10 sigmas, whatever, and then you say, this is what I have, this is my result. There, you do not depend so much on having good statistical tools to describe the data, because the result is so overwhelming that provided you are doing well, you know what you are seeing. Here, you don't have that luxury, because you would like to extract all the information down to the noise level because you are never going to be able to perform another experiment. So you better do your statistics right, and you better sure that there are no systematics dominating your result. It would be a pity that we just cut our data at the five sigma, seven sigma, or 10 sigma, whatever you think it is comfortable, and we throw the rest of the information, right? So the challenge here is to get all the information in the data. Not more, not less. So I'd like to point out to people this uh, beautiful fresco in the, in, the, in the Duomo in Florence in Italy, where you see this uh, heavenly picture of how beautiful life is, but at the very bottom, there is heaven, there is a hell perverting things. This is the same story, right? You may be 
driven by the data and be fooled into making conclusions, but the real gory details are going to drive you into thinking what you are really observing, what you are really inferring, and what is your data really telling you. So let me tell you a few words about cosmology. I'm going to be using some examples referring to cosmology. So I want to tell you a bit about the universe, where we were, and where we are now. So things looked like this 20 years ago when I started my PhD in Copenhagen. Uh, we had a collection of points that it positions and distances of galaxies collected here at the CFA Observatory in Harvard. And those were the data. They were actually published on a printed paper. And you have like a catalog, and that was it. And at the same time, the COVID satellite launched by NASA had detected the ripples in the early universe that lead to the fluctuations that later on will become galaxies and eventually us. Those are changes in temperature from the cosmic microwave background, which is a radiation that it is uh, encompassing all of us, the whole universe. In fact, there is a three Kelvin radiation at microwave wavelengths. You were able to see, if your eyes were at the microwave wavelength, that will be the dominant radiation in the, in the, in the outside when you step out in the sky, much more than anything else, right? Now, the very interesting thing of this map is that if you go and look at it, the signal to noise per pixel is one, right? So at first sight, you will say this is noise. Actually, it is not. These ripples are real because as we were moving forward in 20 years, we collected uh, this map from the Planck satellite. This time it's a European satellite. And this is a cosmic variance limited map. That means this is a map where the error on the power spectrum, which is what I'm showing here, on these points is dominated by the fact that you can measure only a given number of modes in the map, right? So if you want to try to look at the scales as large as the horizon in the sky, then you are going to be dominated by the fact that you have here only one mode looking at it. So I'm going to explain to you in a second what this map is and what the galaxy maps relate to that. But first, let me tell you that uh, these are temperature fluctuations. Red is hot, uh, blue is cold. This is the power spectrum of this map, temperature. And you can see that at one degree in the sky, there is a typical correlation length of where fluctuations clump, right? There's a clumpiness. And that's crucial, actually, to describe the kind of universe we live in. Now, between that and us, there are galaxies. And this is the map produced by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that has been mapping galaxies between us and the early universe. Now, that map is by no means the whole universe. Actually, it's only 1% of the volume of it. So we have a long way to go before we pick up all the, all the information in the universe between us and the early universe. So why do I talk about the CMB and I talk about galaxies? Well, the picture of the universe looks something like this. We know we had a big bang, and I say we think we know that we have we know we have a big bang because we have experimental observational data that support that. Uh, the universe was tiny. Then there was a phase of inflation. And uh, I want to advertise that on Monday there will be a press release at Harvard Astronomy Observatory, allegedly uh, showing data that support inflationary features. So maybe we also have proof of that as well. The universe cools down, so you start like a very tiny point, the speck expands, cools down. As it cools down, tiny fluctuations here grow into our galaxies. And then those galaxies, because of gravity, get together, and you get the structures that you see in pictures of the Hubble Space Telescope or things like that, right? Now, the challenge, of course, is to look at these observables, this data, and infer the physics out of it. 
This, the cosmic macro background, is a surface in this picture. It is just when the plasma cool down enough, so the hydrogen atom form, and then you have photons coming to you. Those photons are the ones from the cosmic macro background. Galaxies occupy all the volume between here and there. And those galaxies tell you things about, you know, everything in physics that you can think about. Things like fundamental particles, fundamental forces, how things are put together, and of course about the universe itself. Now, we have been very successful as to be able to figure out, fitting a model to the data, how to describe the whole universe with only six parameters, which are the ones here. We know that the universe is actually made up of things that uh, we do not see, we do not know, not things like us, baryons. 23% of the universe is dark matter. It's a kind of particle that only interacts with us through gravity. But most of the universe is actually made of what is called the dark energy. It is uh, some kind of force that it is expanding the universe today again. So today we are in an accelerating phase again. If we're, if I was giving this lecture in another 14 billion years. Uh, I wouldn't be talking about cosmology because the only thing you could see in the sky will be the Milky Way. The horizon will be so small that you will not be able to see galaxies outside our one. So it's very interesting that uh, I can talk today and not later on. <laughs> um, uh, so we have these parameters that describe the, un the observations but we do not know or we don't have a very good physical explanation about what most of the universe is made of. And I think that's why this British tabloid, the Daily News, published this thing that 96% of the universe is missing. Actually, this is wrong because it is 100%, because even the baryons, you and me, we don't have a good explanation why we are here. Because in principle, there should be as much matter as antimatter. We should be annihilated. So there shouldn't be anything here. So I would say 100% of the universe is missing. An explanation is really needed to explain the universe, which is great, right? Because most of you are graduate students or master students. So there you go. It's something to work on, uh, figure out, and then tell us what it is, right? So let me, this is my motivation. This is cosmology. This is what I do. Let me go into now the gory details of how to deal with data and to show you techniques that are new and that I think will be interesting to you here at the EACS for what you are trying to do and, and develop, right? To deal with data and understand computer science and apply, apply science. So how do you deal with too much data? What do you do when you have too much data and you cannot handle them, right? Let me give you a very simple example. You have two measurements, one and two, and they come with error bars. This one is larger, this one is smaller. So imagine your computer cannot handle more than one measurement. So you are given the choice of, please, uh, you cannot do this computation with the two of them. So one thing you can do, very naive, is to throw these data sets. You say the error bar is larger. I don't consider it. I throw it. Well, that's good. You get an estimate of the quantity you want to measure, but it is not optimal. You have thrown away information. Of course, the thing you do is to inverse variance weight the data, right? You know that the error on that quantity is actually the inverse of the square of the errors on the variance of each of the data. Now, this is a linear combination of the data sets that gives you the optimal value to weight your data. Yeah, sorry. So, yes, it's one over that. Sorry about that. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is actually to generalize this and uh, um, put a, do some more sophisticated stuff when you want to deal with more data. Now, the literature is rich in methods that uh, reduce redundant data, like PCA, Principal Component Analysis, but it is very difficult to go from principal component analysis to parameter estimation. Because the data set is being broken in components, right? 
but it tells you very little about the parameters. You don't know if each of the components maybe carries 10 parameters or only one. So the question I want to address here is how do I estimate parameters from too much data so, or from the data? So here is the thing I want to do. Imagine I have a model that describes my data set. And that model has m parameters. <laughs> Now, let me assume that m is much smaller than the number of data I have, right? If m is the same as the number of data, really there is not much I can do. But if m is significantly smaller than the number of data, I said, well, there must be a, an optimal way to weight those data sets. So I end up with one data per parameter. In principle, that's all I need, right, in an ideal world. One data per parameter. So my data are composed of a sig signal plus noise. And what I want to do is to calculate the weights, and this will be a vector, that uh, I dot with my scalar product with my data, such that at I get a single number. That number now is one per parameter, and the only thing I'm going to do then is do a maximum likelihood of those compressed data set with my parameters. So one data, one parameter, I'm done. So looking, going back to the example in cosmology, that map I show you about the CMB has one million pixels, five parameters. So instead of having to do one million it, uh, evaluations, I want to do five. How do I do that? Well, here is the solution that uh, we propose to do it. So, uh, I'm going to do the following. I want to do, I want to throw away data or to combine the data in a smart way so I do not lose information. Now, in this, in this context, what do I mean by I'm not losing information? What I'm going to do is to use the Fisher matrix. The Fisher matrix is just the second derivative of the likelihood over the parameters. That is the curvature of the likelihood surface. And I'm going to impose the condition that uh, the data and the compressed data sets have the same feature matrices at the maximum. That's going to be my imposition for the data, for the, for, the condi for the compressed data set not to lose any information. So if I have the likelihood and the parameter, those two likelihoods should look the same at the maximum, right? I'm going to make mistakes in the tails. They are going to be different, and especially the likelihoods are very non-Gaussian. It is going to be different, but you will see that actually the method works amazingly well, even if you abandon this uh, condition. So just uh, a few formulas to remind you. This is the definition of the Fisher matrix. The error is the inverse of the diagonal elements of the Fisher matrix. That's the error of your Gaussian. So now you just proceed like this. You take your likelihood for the parameters, just your data minus your model, inverse covariance matrix, your error, times the data minus the model. And what you do is just to impose at the maximum that the likelihood made with the compressed data set and the likelihood made with the real data are exactly the same. So what that gives you is the following equation. That's the Fisher matrix. Alpha and beta are now the parameters. B are my weights. This comma means I take derivatives of the, fish of the covariance matrix with respect to the parameters I'm looking for. That's the equation you have. Now what I do is to maximize that equation, right? Because that was the Fisher matrix. And what I said is I want the Fisher matrix at the maximum to be equal to the other one, to be zero. So basically, I maximize that equation with this constraint because actually these are numbers in the denominator. And it doesn't matter if I scale up and down the Fisher matrix by a constant. So to make my life easier, I'm going just to take these constraints. Well, if you write down that equation, turns out that what you have is actually a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. And I do not know how to solve that. I highlight this because maybe you know how to solve it. So if you know how to do it, uh, please uh, go ahead. But for the most general problem, 
where both the mean and the covariance matrix depend on the parameters that you are trying to measure, I do not know how to solve the problem. So how do I solve the problem? Well, what I do is I'm going to assume that the covariance matrix error does not depend on the parameters. If that's the case, then this becomes a linear problem. Becomes a linear problem, and then I can automatically compute the weights. And the weights are shown here, how they look like. So the weight now is the inverse of the covariance taking derivatives with respect to the parameter, and then you just combine it with something. Now, to do this, you have to choose a fiducial model. Because, of course, you can demonstrate mathematically that this result is exact if the model is the right one. But you do not know a priori which model is the right one. So the way you proceed is the following. You choose a fiducial model and uh, take derivatives with respect to the parameters, and that's going to give you the value for these weights. Once you have that value, you proceed to dot it with the data, and therefore you have the reduced and compressed data set, and then you do the likelihood on the reduced and compressed data set, which now becomes a normal, a likelihood with variance equal one. So it is terribly easy to do it, and then you can estimate uh, very fast what you are doing. So two issues I want to discuss. First is the dependence on the fiducial model. You need to choose a fiducial model to actually convert to the solution. And second, the speed up of the method. So with respect to the fiducial model, uh, it can be shown for many problems that actually the choice of the fiducial model is irrelevant, that you, co you converge very quickly to the right solution trivially. So you have to choose only one fiducial model. But uh, one thing we did with Pavlos here was to actually show that even for problems where you would think a priori that the fiducial model is crucial in determining those weights, that is, a problem where it is impossible to have a fiducial model that captures the information, you can actually do it also very efficiently in the following way. You can choose several fiducial models at random, and you will see that the right one will immediately come up as the one that maximizes the likelihood. So even if you had to do this like 20 times, then it will be extremely efficient. And the reason for that is that the following. Uh, the problem we applied this method to was when we were trying to find exoplanets, planets outside the uh, solar system. So in that case, what you have is that the planet is going to be in front of the star, is going to make an, a, a, an occultation, and therefore is going to dim the star. Of course, that is very, very tiny. So you can only do it statistically, in the sense that you have to see many times that thing happening, and then you add them up together, and you see the signal. The problem is that uh, to add them up together, you need to know how often this thing happens. Because if you are closer, you go very fast, if you are far away, you go very slow. So how do you know that? You do not know. You have to do a search in parameter space. Now, this time series is a telescope, and some of you have been at the telescope in Chile, is collecting light every minute, every five minutes, every half an hour, every hour, and then collects data. Let's say you have a series of 10,000 data points, right? How do you find that? Well, you only need to find the transit, so that's one parameter. And then the distance between the transit does, let's say, two parameters. But you have 10,000 points. What a waste, right? You don't have enough information there. You only have two parameters describing the data. Now, using this, what you can do is to accelerate the problem by a factor of 5,000. Because you only have two parameters, you compute these weights, you compute a few fiducial models, you pick up the one that it is the right one, and then now you take the 10,000 data but instead of having to use the 10,000 data, you dot the data with the weights, you have two data points compared with the two parameters you are looking for, and almost on a piece of paper you can do it, right? So that's one application that we did for the problem that uh, results in a massive acceleration of compression, right? 
There are many other instances where you can use the theme, right? Uh, one thing that uh, we did was to, to have an, we, we actually there is a spin-off company that what is doing is the following, as not to talk about cosmology all the time. Uh, so you know, well, I hope you don't know actually, because uh, if, you go to, if you go to have a scan at the medical doctor, you're always told to please stand still for at least a few minutes, right? And you have to be there, the MRI is taking now, the reason for that is that if you move very little, then the image blurs, and therefore you, they cannot detect whatever they are looking for, right? A fracture or whatever it is, right? Or maybe it can be something more serious like detecting a cancer. Now, that takes time and effort, right? So what you would like really to do is to actually be able to combine images extremely fast to do an affine transformation of your head. Imagine they are looking at your head, right? So it is a rotation and a translation extremely fast, so you can actually pile them up together and increase the signal to noise to a lot. Now, you can do that with this algorithm that we call Moped, because what you can do is that that affine transformation is just a few parameters. You have an immense amount of data, but you can actually rotate the things or translate the thing very, very fast or squeeze them until you go add those images. So instead the guy having to stand still for two minutes, then he only needs to be there for a second two seconds, three seconds, off you go, and then you have people just getting nervous in this tube and all that. So that has been applied actually to, to medical imaging. That's one example of where you need to actually compress enormously the data set. I'm going to skip this because it's a bit more uh, astronomical and cosmological, and uh, this is something that I already told you about, uh, about, uh, about the speed up and how to do that. But I want to emphasize one thing. It is not only that you need to find the best solution. You also would like to give error bars to the parameters you have found, right? Otherwise, this is not very professional not to give a confidence interval. Now, to give confidence intervals, most of the times what you have to do is an exploration of the parameter space. And if you have more than three, four parameters, the most efficient way to explore, to explore your parameter space is to do a Markov chain. And I know Paulus has been telling you about Markov chains the last week or something like that, right? So you basically sample the likelihood surface by random jumps. Uh, I mean, uh, Markov chain is something very obvious, right? It's the way you get out of a mountain. It's just you explore where you want to go. Just going the downhill, the steepest descent. So it is the same thing with the likelihood, right? You explore how to get out from there and find the maximum. Now, to do that costs you money, right? You have to evaluate the likelihood many times. So instead of having to evaluate it with 10,000 points, you evaluate it with two, you do many, many explorations very fast. So if you, have co if you have a Gaussian surface, it's very easy to do it. But if you have very complicated surfaces like banana degeneracy in the parameter space, it's very costly to do that. So one great thing of these compression algorithms is that you can evaluate you know, these are parameters, just uh, look at these like parameters. You can evaluate complicated likelihood surfaces very, very fast because this took about 300,000 evaluations to actually find the convergence on the chain, on the Markov chain. Now, imagine that you have 300,000 evaluations and each evaluation is sped up by a factor of thousands. It's a huge amount of uh, speed that you are getting out of your evaluation, right? Now, also remember that uh, your code is never bug free. You always need to check it again. Uh, your, para your model can improve. So you need to do this thing many times, right? It's not that you need to do this thing only once and that's it, you are done and you never make a mistake, right? You need to look at these things many, many times. You need to uh, debug your code, you need to do things. So speeding up things is actually crucial to, act, to extract parameters from uh, the data that we look at. So, so much for that. Let me now move to the next uh, subject that I want to touch upon. So, okay, great. I have so much data. Now uh, my statistical error bar is decreasing, 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 decreasing to nothing. I'm very happy. But now I do see that my error bar is dominated by systematic errors, right? I was using a ruler to measure my height, and it turns out that instead of a meter, it was three centimeters longer, right? So 
I told you I'm one meter and three centimeters, and in reality I'm one meter, right? That's my systematic error. I'm using the wrong ruler to measure distances. How do I get rid of them? Well, if you know it, then it is trivial. You treat it as another parameter, you marginalize over it in the likelihood, you just integrate over, and end of the story. But what about the more interesting case when you do not know what the systematic error is? How do you uh, get rid of these nonsense parameters? Well, I'm going to show you some uh, extremely general algorithm that you can use to actually get these uh, nonsense parameters out of the way and actually uh, reduce this thing. You will marginalize uh, <coughs> the system. It's not a random variable. Can you do that? Yes, you can do that, right? Because uh, it is not a random variable, but if it has a mean and an error bar associated with it, you just take it out. For that, you have to know the systematics, right? It is the unknowns, unknowns, what actually bother you. It is what it is in the data you didn't know about that it is making you make a claim and then to, uh, let me give you an example. Many years ago, in 1986, there was a enormous excitement because uh, a satellite launching a rocket uh, had measured that actually the sky didn't look the way we think it looks like, the CMB, but it looked completely different, right? There was gigantic excitement about that, right? There was new theories about the, the universe, everything was completely different. Well, at the end it turned out that the satellite had looked at the exhaust of the rocket propeller, <laughs> right? And that was actually what was creating all the excitement. That's a systematic, you didn't know about that. They found it looking at things, but is there any, you know, non-human intervention way to actually get rid of that and discover a priori or posteriori that you had that in the data, right? Let me give you a very simple example of how you could get rid of a nonsense parameter. So I have a toy sample again. I have two measurements, X and Y. These are the interesting quantities. These are my physical parameters. But then I have a systematic here and what I call the nonsense parameter. Well, it is obvious that the way to get rid of that nonsense parameter is to multiply x times y. So now you lost data, but you got rid of the systematic. Now, this is because you knew the form of the nonsense parameters, but I didn't have to know the mean or the, or the, or the error or anything like that, right? I only knew the functional form. Well, that's a good trick how to follow. So let's try to generalize this and then see if we can have a general machinery to do it. So this is the setup that we are proposing. Imagine that they have n observables, O, that depend on m interesting quantities. m are my physical parameters or whatever you are trying to figure out about data, right? And n noisance quantities, my systematic errors, it is something really I do not want. That's something that it is biasing my measurement, making make the wrong inference on the theta. And I'm ignorant about the mean and errors of these nonsense parameters. I really do not know how, what is the statistics, right? Well, what I have to do following the previous hint is to find combination of the observables that are insensitive to the nonsense parameters, right? Now, how do I do that? The way you will do that is to take a, a function that it is only a function of the observables, construct the derivative, the total derivative, and then get rid of the dependence of the observable to the nonsense parameters, right? So you have to make some inference about the functional form of those parameters, nonsense parameters, but the fact is that that will actually take off the nonsense parameters out of the way. Okay, so that's very nice, but let me tell you more about this because this equation is more interesting than you think. Yes? Okay. Sorry? I'll talk to you later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now, this equation actually is the equation of the renormalization group. The, normal, the renormalization group is a technique 
that basically uh, tells you how your system, your physical system, reacts to changes in the scales. So if you, basically in physics we believe that uh, if you take a magnifier, right, the, phys the laws of physics shouldn't change as we look at different scales to it, right? Uh, this is telling you that the real parameters that should be left in your equation, in your combination of the observables, should be only that combination that it is insensitive to the scale to which you change the nuisance parameter. So the real physics, the real parameter, should not be dependent on the scale at which you hit the systematic on the data. That's what it is telling you. And that's the hint that we use to proceed with this. So let me give you an example. Yes, sir. If the derivative is equal to zero at some value of mu, it means it's maximum. So what you want is this to be true for all values of mu, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Otherwise, you just find the maximum. Otherwise, you don't find so the you maximum. Become, yes, okay, yeah, so yeah, that's why you want the total derivative, right? Are you summing over all? Yes, the, exactly. Okay. So let me warm up the, the, the ideas to give you an example. So let's just start with a very simple dependence on the nuisance parameters. Let's imagine that you have a power law dependence. You know that you have some systematic that it is a, a, a power law, right? Uh, you write down the previous differential equations and then you find the solution. The solution you have to do is to construct function of your observables that looks something like this subject to this constraint. Now, these combinations are not trivial. And actually, I can show you that if you apply that uh, to, your, uh, to, your, to your data, to some examples that you may have, you will find that there are no trivial combinations that you, didn't th that you thought about that appear in those functions to actually get rid of the systematic errors. So that's the solution where you have like a power of dependence on the, on the nuisance parameter. If you have a, a linear dependence, it will be very, very, very similar. Now, I, I want to do some uh, puntualizations here. I want to just uh, bear, um, say something about uh, marginalization. Uh, you cannot do better than marginalization. You know, I'm not saying that this is going to do better than marginalization. Marginalization and this will be equivalent. But for marginalization, you need to know the mean and the statistics of your systematics. And that's not something that you may know a priori or may be able to identify. So for marginalization, you need to assume the mean and the errors. And that's maybe not possible all the times. This is much more agnostic about what the nuisance parameters look like. I mean, you need to input a functional form or a functional dependence, right? It's not possible not to know anything and try to figure out something. Now, one of the important things is that you need more data than nonsense parameters, obviously, right? If you are dominated by systematics and you don't have data to get rid of them, there is no way you can actually do it. There's a very interesting case is actually when the observables have similar but not identical dependence on the nuisance parameter, right? So you attempt to make a measurement and your systematic is in the most dangerous case that it is going to be very similar to the observable dependence, right? In this case, you can actually find a solution, an exact solution that can give you the best combination of the, for this function f. So I put here the formula. I do not want you to go through the technical details, but what I wanted to illustrate here is that there are closed formulas that we have derived that can help you to get rid of the systematic errors in your observations, especially if you have some idea about what is the dependence, the functional dependence of the noise parameter. So I have been talking for 41 minutes. Let me move to the last part of my talk which is the following. I have been telling you about uh, 
how to compress the data set and extract parameters, how to get rid of the systematic errors. But now I want to do something else, right? I have so much data and many of these data are independent measurements of the same quantity. Let me give you a very nice example. So this is the universe as a function of time, as I was telling about. We are here, and nearly 14 billion years ago, there was what we call the cosmic microwave background, right? So what we cosmologists do is to take this picture from the satellite, and from here, from these million data points, infer parameters for our favorite cosmological models, right? Now, with that model, I can describe the rest of the universe. But of course, I can do something else. I can actually measure the universe here and infer the same parameters. Because it is the same universe, it is the same physical laws, the model extrapolated universe should be the same as the one I measure locally, right? Now, if I compare the two, they should be the same, or if I compare them and they are not the same, that means that I'm missing some physics, that I'm missing an extra parameters because these two things are not the same. So here comes the question, when can I compare two distributions? If they are on top of each other, it's trivial, the answer is you can go ahead and compare them. If they are very far away, then you know their intention, they're incompatible. One is measuring the height of a person, the other one is measuring the age of the universe. They have nothing to do with each other, right? It's the common saying, pears and apples, right? Uh, but you have to quantify that, right? Uh, at what point you can combine two distributions? So that's something that we did here, and uh, the interesting thing here is that you can have a decision tool, a decision algorithm that tells you when you can combine two data sets. And that you can apply to everything you like in life. I'm going to give you the example for cosmology. So I want to highlight the two papers that we, that we have been uh, working on this and also highlight that this is something that uh, we have been doing with Pablos, uh, very much uh, playing with these things. So I think I said this at the beginning, but let me say it again, cosmologists are Bayesian. We are testing the model, right? We are not frequenties. We have a model, we have observation, we have to, we cannot repeat the experiment, right? We cannot throw the dice many times until we know what it is. We can only throw the dice one. So we have to be biased and we have to test the model. So, I think this is interesting to remind when you are doing a Bayesian uh, expectation evidence, right? Is that of all the parameters values you thought were viable before the data came along, how well on average did they feed the data, right? That's what you really want to answer. So some uh, formulas to recall uh, things on, in, on base inference. Uh, the base theorem, uh, so basically when you take some data and you put a model, you are not actually measuring how likely the model is given the data, you're actually uh, looking at how likely the data are given the model, and it is using base theorem that you can go to from one to another. To do that, you need to use a prior on your model. You have to decide on your parameters in the model what is the most likely, he, likely range. And that's what people talk about when they say, when you have an experiment on observation, you better not be dominated by the prior because otherwise it is the prior information what is going to determine your posterior. You should be dominated by the data, your prior should be very, very tiny. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's not good that I put a prior of a one a meter and 80 centimeters to measure the height of a person because basically I'm going to be dominated by that. I better put a prior between zero and one kilometer and from measurements determine what is the height of a human being, right? Your prior should be much, much uh, less restricted than your data. Now, when you do want to do parameter fitting, that's what you use. You use the base, the base theorem where you put here a parameter given your model. Now, you can go one step forward and do base for the model itself, right? You can now say, what is the evidence, and that's why it is called E with an evidence, for the model that I'm fitting. 
And then when you compare two models, you just do the ratio of this base evidence. So what you do is that you take the posterior and you integrate it over the, over the distribution. Now, if you do that, then a long time ago, the people that do information theory tell you how likely is or how much a model is better than the other at describing the data. And this is called this Jeffries scale. And it says that, well, if you compute the quantity, this, this evidence in the log, it gives you a scale to decide when a model is better than another, right? So you have that scale, and then you make a decision based on that, basically on the statistics on throwing things, how likely, or I, I like better the odds, how likely it is that one model is much better than the other model you are comparing and describing the data. So in this way, you can go one step forward from just testing a model, you can also decide which model is better at describing the data. However, not everything is rosy in this life. So let me give you, you must be almost uh, falling asleep, but so it's a good to give you a quiz. Uh, imagine I have this situation, right? I, this is my likelihood surface, looks like a Gaussian. And I add an extra parameter to my model. So I have find the universe, I have a new theory, I want to add an extra parameter. And then the, a, the, the likelihood surface then looks something like this. So my quiz is, what would the evidence ratio say about these models? The one with x parameters and the one with x plus one, plus one parameters. Uh, no? <laughs> Any takers for this quiz? Uh, I will answer the quiz. The evidence will say nothing because this is a flat reach, right? You cannot actually make a decision because adding a parameter doesn't change the likelihood, right? So it doesn't know how to decide. And in fact, I took the pain to write down the demonstration here. And you don't have to read at this, you can look at it uh, offline that the evidence will be agnostic because the two models actually will be the same. So you have to be careful, the lesson here is that you have to be careful with these pathological situations where you add a, a parameter and then you are sort of improving the likelihood but not changing the shape of the, 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 the absolute value of the likelihood, right? So based on that, we decided to tackle the problem of when you are able or, or you can combine two distributions. So you have two measurements of the same underlying parameter, and those two distributions have one sigma, two sigma, or confidence levels, and they look something like this. Now my question to you is that uh, am I allowed to combine them and make an inference on the because if I combine the two of them, of course, I can get much smaller confidence levels, right? Because if I multiply these likelihoods, then they will cut something like here. It's much smaller than this arrow bar. I'm happy, right? Uh, if you are young, you get tenure, right? Uh, look, I reduced the arrow bar by a factor of 10. But uh, what about if they are like this, right? They only overlap at five sigma. Then you're going to get an arrow bar that it is 10 times smaller. Can you do it or not? Are the two distributions compatible? So what we did was to develop an algorithm to actually decide. So we took a cue from the base evidence and said, okay, let's do something very simple. You can take the two distribution, put them on top of the other, and check the null hypothesis, right? If the evidence tells you that moving one distribution on top of each other is better than not moving them, then you can combine them. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, and then we introduce this, this thing that we call tension, which is the is something very, very easy. Compute the evidences for these two models, then put them on top of each other, compute the ratio. That will give you a tension number. Go to the Jeffries scale and then decide whether or not they are in tension. So let me not show you this, but let me show you an example. So an example that happened just a few months ago, 
is that uh, we measure the universe at the CMB with extreme precision. We infer the expansion rate, how fast is expanding the universe. We look independently, we measure the expansion rate today, and then we found that the results do not agree. So this is the situation. This is the measurement of the expansion rate locally today. It has a larger bar. These blue lines are the measurement inferred from the early universe of what the expansion rate should be today. If the model is the same, these two things should be on top of each other. If the model is not the same, then these two things. So what people did, they just combined these two distributions. However, when we did the evidence calculation, what we found is that the likelihood of these two distributions measuring the same parameters are actually pretty low. It's one in 53. That's like you know, two and a half sigma, so more like this. So either there is new physics or there is a systematic error that has been going into here, but you are not allowed to combine them. You cannot. Because they are not compatible. They are not measuring the same thing. There is either new physics or a systematic in it. So when we look at the, I can just show you, if you look in the Jeffries scale, right, this number that we got puts you something here, and this guy will tell you that there is a very strong evidence that those distributions do not look like each other, right? They are like a bit uh, something like that, right? A few more than three sigmas or, or about that. So that was one example of whether combining data is not uh, granted or you cannot do it. And you will think, well, that's fine, right? But so people go around claiming that they have discovered neutrino masses, which is a particle, based on that, on combining those data sets. But actually, you cannot do it. You are combining two data that are not in agreement with each other. So let me conclude here exactly at 2 PM. Uh, I have shown you uh, that uh, cosmology astronomy is actually very exciting because uh, um, we can go and extract all the information that there is in the sky. We can actually go and do observations that will pick up and collect all the information. It's a limited amount of information that we have out there. And that's exciting, right? It means that uh, ambitious people can actually go and do it. And people have done it. <coughs> the problem with this uh, thing is that you have so much data that parameter testing is extremely difficult. And you want to test parameters because physics is simple and it has very few parameters describing the whole nature. So I have shown you some techniques to compress your data. I have also shown you some techniques to get rid of the systematic errors in those data when you have some information about the functional form of the errors and therefore get rid of that uh, uh, bias in your parameter estimation that it is not good. And finally, I have shown you an algorithm technique to decide when and how you can combine two me different measurements of the same parameter or when two measurements are measuring actually the same parameters. I have illustrated this with uh, cosmological examples, but uh, this is applicable to any problem you have when you have a lot of data and you have a model. You have a model and you have a lot of data. I hope these things are useful to you to analyze them and extract the parameters for your model. So I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. This is perhaps very far-fetched, but um, if you look at like the Framingham Heart Study, which has followed people for 30 years, yes. so on each person, relatively, nothing like the sky, but relatively, there's a lot of data. And the difference is there's many, many parameters, right? I mean, there's so many parameters. But do you think something like this, I mean, could, if you lump the parameters somehow, you know, because there's so many, you know, all the different things they measure in the blood and all the different, you know, could something like this be used to help 
us figure out the parameters which matter the most? Yes. You think yes. so? Yes, because, because, yes, absolutely. So when you construct the method to compress the data, you remember you had to build these uh, eigenvectors that are the weights that you give to the data. Now, it's exactly the problem you are describing because you are saying, look, I have all this data. Some of them may be junk because they are not sensitive to the parameters. Or the reverse. I have all these parameters and all this data, but maybe these parameters are not describing at all the data because they are not relevant at all, right? So you can actually take your model, compute the compressed eigenvectors, and decide, which, uh, or, or when you do the, the calculation, look at the weights and see which ones are the most significant to the problem you are addressing. So it will actually, it will actually you can use it to do a experimental design. It will tell you where the, which data you should look at to measure your parameter. Maybe it's all the data, and then you gain nothing with this data compression, right? Or maybe it's just a localized whatever, you know, in your data in a spike, right? And then you can throw away the rest of the data and collect that one. Well, I would guess that for different conditions, it's going to be different parameters, like cancer, heart versus heart attack versus this versus that, you see? Okay. I mean, it's not, there's no one model. We're going to, we need to model everything. Uh, not everything, but many diseases. Right. But probably the parameters of importance will matter relative to the disease you're doing. I mean, that's just probably what will end up happening. Okay. So it's not like all the data is garbage. It's just relevant to different parts. Okay, Maybe. so then you have to do, uh, like, uh, for each model you are testing, test that model that you believe is the right one for the current situation. And then, you know, part of the data for that model particular model you are testing will not be relevant. So you just, it will automatically compress them and tell you the idea of what you are looking at. Are the conclusions about the existence of dark matter and dark energy free of these possible statistical? They are, matter? but you make an extremely good question. And, and it's, they are, but if I was given this talk 10 years ago, I would have answered to you, we do not know. The reason we know now is that uh, we have measured this dark energy from many different uh, observations that are independent. And we know that now we can combine them together and actually get very strong evidence at more than 10 sigma that dark energy exists. But it was not the case 10 years ago because of the dominance through systematic errors. And in fact, most people thought that was the case. Uh, yeah, for the last example that you showed, uh, yes. have you applied so far? I mean, since since it's a new physics or systematic error, have you applied the the other the cancelling out the systematic uncertainties? Have you tried to do that to see if it? Is, yes. It so we have tried to do that, and we have discovered that there's a systematic shift in those data. So actually, I'm pretty sure that the data have a systematic hidden there. It has to be new physics, or is there something? No, the conclusion is that there is no new physics. There is no new physics. Yes, that's the conclusion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.